Hello, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Their Greatest Threats Come From Within. My name is Kevin Collins from Unitrends, and I'm here with Dick Sappler, Product Marketing Manager, and he'll be taking us through the presentation. Don't forget, one lucky attendee will be walking away with a $100 Amazon gift card. We will announce the winner at the end of the webinar. But before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. The session will be recorded, and after the event, you'll receive an email with a link to the on-demand version of the webinar. I would also you encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. You can do so by typing them into the Q&A box on the bottom right of the player. We'll answer your questions at the end of the session. At this point, I'll turn it over to Dick. Enjoy the presentation, and Dick, take it away. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining today. I uh, hope not to take too much of your time. As Kevin said, my name is Dick Sappler. I'm Product Marketing Manager, uh, and I'm coming today to you today from beautiful Burlington, Massachusetts, 75 degrees and sunny, gorgeous day. So, um, But I really wanted to uh, take you through uh, what we, some research that we have found that uh, actually outlines the most common causes of downtime. And uh, for most people, it's not what you'd think. Um, and I always usually start my webcasts uh, with this slide, just because to show you the financial impact of downtime on a corporation. Uh, the industry has settled at around $9,000 per minute of uh, the average cost of downtime. Obviously, that varies depending on the size of your company or the industry you're in, the applications that are down, and so forth. But pretty much, it's about $9,000 per minute. And so uh, even if you think you had 99.9% .9 uptime, that still equates to about an hour's worth of downtime per month or costing your company about 400K. And if you can get that up to what's called four nines, which really starts getting into preventative uh, steps uh, and keeping downtime from happening, not just by recovering quickly, but doing some preventative work, uh, you can literally save your company you know, about $400,000 uh, per month, uh, which is an incredible amount of savings. So what we're talking about here is real money. So um, prior to joining uh, Unitrends uh, about a year and a half ago, I was an industry analyst for the Aberdeen Group. And uh, I had uh, a data center practice, and I had customers such as Stratus and NEC uh, who really focused in on uh, preventing downtime uh, with, with fault-tolerant hardware. And I would do research for them to find the major causes of the downtime. And I constantly found that the major cause of downtime was actually internal causes, employees, or bad business practices internal to the organization. Uh, and this frustrated me because really I, what I wanted to find was that you know hardware issues, um, data center issues, natural disasters and all were the primary cause of downtime. But what you can see from this data is that the number one cause of issue is human error followed by software issues. Those two account for almost half of all the causes of downtime within your data center. Uh, you also add in server room issues, um, power outages, things like that. Um, and uh, and you, before you really get to the major causes of downtime that are advertised and marketed so aggressively by companies such as uh, Unitrends, they really only account for about 25% of the causes. And they would be you know, an on-site disaster, uh, ransomware, hardware error, natural disaster. So if you went out and looked at all the, the marketing content uh, around disaster recovery, what you'd see is really most of that marketing is around the 25% of downtime and not the 75% that in effect really is the cause of downtime. So your downtime uh, and, and disaster recovery solutions obviously need to protect uh, causes from internal and human error. So that's really the, the point of this presentation, is that the cause of downtime really is an internal problem most of the time. Okay, so it really comes down to employees because that's, that's who's uh, working it. And, and hu employees are human. Humans make mistakes and sometimes they get uh, uh, mean and nasty. But uh, really there's five types of employees that you need uh, to account for in your data protection strategy. And the first is um, those that install untested software. And this is the number two cause of downtime uh, in the industry. Um, 
you would think that software coming from a, a vendor, uh, even someone as uh, like Google or Microsoft, some of the larger vendors, that the software that they give you has been tested to the point where you can deploy it without testing it in your own production environment. And that is just wrong. You need to test that software and how it will interact on your own production environment, with your own software, uh, with all of the other uh, applications that are running. And, uh, and that's the only way you know that that software won't cause a failure uh, when it gets installed. And to do that, what you really need to do is you spin up a test or dev environment so, uh, completely divorced from your production environment where you can then load the software, test it, run it, uh, boot it up, bring it down, bring it, bring it back up, um, do all the QA tests that you normally do to your own software. Um, and you can do this with a uh, technology that's included in some of the more di advanced disaster recovery solutions, an application or a technology called copy data management. And basically what it does is it uses the backups and brings up a test and dev environment that is on a remote server. Um, it uh, can be in a test and dev environment on your main server, um, on the backup appliance, or even on a remote server in the cloud. Uh, so it uses the backup data, which is an exact copy of production. So that's uh, very important. Um, you can actually... Uh, test your failover while you're there, um, and you can control access to just the key stakeholders, just the testers, and it does can support both the physical and virtual environments. So you need to be able to have uh, an applic the function of copy data management, and you need this to be a, a process that you go through before you release any software into your production environment, and that's to test it in a test and dev environment. Now, our uh, uh, tests, our CDM capability also includes something that you wouldn't think of, and that is that we have integrated security into our CDM function. So with Unitrends uh, 10.1, which is what you should be on if you're a current customer, hint, hint, um, we include a copy of ClamAV antivirus software. It's an open source Linux-based software, uh, antivirus software that comes with the operating system. And you can actually scan your backups for any malware or uh, any other bad uh, agents that are in it prior to spinning it up in a test and dev environment. And you think, why would I need that? Because um, the test and dev environment's isolated from production. If it's uh, riddled with ransomware, you just take it down and so forth. But sometimes your production and servers are so taxed that they can't afford uh, the, the uh, impact that a security scan would put on the applications while they're running. So there are production servers out there that are running without a virus scanner, and they're creating data, creating files, updating data, and so forth. So you can offload then some of that security function off your production servers. You can then run uh, ClamAV, any virus, against your backups and ensure that they are virus-free. So it's just another step you can take to protect yourself against ransomware. Okay, so uh, copy data management, very important. The number two addresses the number two cause of downtime in your environment. Uh, number two, malicious employees. Um, so when I was an analyst, this was very hard research to do. Um, I would send out surveys to literally my thousand or so um, companies that I uh, was had a relationship with and ask about, you know, how many times that they had a malicious employee or, or what did they do. And, and, and very few companies were willing to admit that they had this sort of an issue because no one wants to admit that their HR, system, HR department dropped the ball so bad that one of their employees got so angry that they were trying to do damage to the company on his way out the door. Um, or that they, you know, employ they hired bad employees. It was just embarrassing to the corporation. So we really don't have a true idea of the impact of uh, malicious employees or what sort of harm that they do. Companies keep that very hush-hush. 
So the first technology that I'm going to talk about um, is going to seem counterintuitive. Uh, this is called role-based management. And what role-based management does is it really provides, uh, it allows more organizations and more people to manage their own backup and recovery program. So it provides self-service and granular control of backups to uh, experts within the remote departments. So you can literally assign um, you know, the HR people to manage their own HR files, their own HR backups. If they're missing a file, they can go in and do the recovery themselves. And so this is somewhat counterintuitive in that you're, I'm basically advocating here that uh, you allow more people to get involved in managing backups. And on the face of it, it looks like it does increase uh, the scope that a malicious employee could do harm to the company. But really what the, uh, a really good role-based management uh, operation does, it not only offloads IT from uh, having to manage everybody's files, and if you're even a mid-sized corporation, it's a massive operation, and you cannot be an expert on all the different types of files and all the different types of data. But good role-based management functionality will, will really limit um, the uh, role-based managers to just the systems or the databases <clears throat> or the files that they need in order to do their job. So they can't even see what the other uh, technologies, what the other files are and so forth. So they are, it does, in a, in, a, in a good sense, limit the scope of their control over the files and so forth. So um, for, for reducing the effect of the uh, malicious employee, obviously you have to follow best practices <clears throat> um, for protecting your data. Uh, you need to follow the 321 data protection strategy. Um, that is, you need three copies of your data in two different formats and one of them located off-site and, uh, and unconnected to the Internet. So a little diagram here, uh, we have our recovery appliances uh, at the factory, at the office, and in the cloud. You can do replication from uh, one site to the other. They can back each other up, and then you can put copies uh, in the off-site, in the cloud. Um, you also, uh, the cloud is excellent for, uh, for uh, getting data off-site and out of the reach of any uh, employees that may wish you harm. Uh, it's low-cost storage. Uh, you can get infinite retention up in the cloud, and you can even archive the stores uh, as well as use them for disaster recovery as a service, which I'll talk about a little later on. So you really do want to get that data off-site and out of the reach of the malicious employee. Um, but there's one set of applications that you really need to be focused on, and that is your Office uh, applications, your Office 365. Um, those are the uh, files that uh, employees have access to the most, you know, their email, um, SharePoint, uh, and, uh, and their files, and those are the ones that they're most likely to delete. Now, you would think that um, App, uh, Microsoft's Office 365 has archiving and, and data backup protection, but they really don't. Um, so if an employee, for example, was to go into Office, uh, delete their emails, and then empty their mailbox from their cloud Office 365, those files are lost forever. Uh, so you really need third-party protection, such as Unitrend's Office 365 protection in the cloud. Um, we make infinite copies of all of the emails, SharePoint files, OneDrive, and so forth, and no one can ever really delete them. Uh, they can delete them from their visible desktops, but they are replicated and stored in a separate site within uh, the Microsoft Cloud. Uh, you can get granular recovery of the emails. Somebody uh, deletes their entire email, uh, walks out the door, you can recover it literally within five minutes. So this is the application that you most have to protect against malicious employees, uh, and this you need a third-party uh, Office 365 protection capability. Okay, number three, ransomware clickbait. You know, you can do all the education that you think you, you can, uh, you know, about uh, training your employees not to click on uh, files, not to download uh, things that they shouldn't, uh, and you can get the best antivirus software that you can possibly get, but you're probably 
you, you're, you're going to get infected. It's just a matter of time. Um, they're getting very good, ransomware criminals are getting very good at changing up uh, ransomware. And so uh, this is the latest data I could find about uh, ransomware attacks by industry. Uh, so you can see there that if you're in the education, finance, or particularly healthcare industries, um, they account for about 75% of the ransomware attacks. And why? Um, because of easy access and because the data is so valuable. Uh, the, uh, those three industries are more likely to pay a ransom uh, than other industries. So um, ransomware is evolving. Uh, it used to be that ransomware would get in your system and try to infect every single file it could find. Uh, they're becoming a little bit more discreet now. They get in your system, uh, they take their time, they roam around, they slowly uh, encrypt your files with the point that they want to be able to operate under the covers as long as possible to ensure that a ransom will be paid. So uh, your ransomware protection needs to evolve along the same way. So you really need to have, um, you really need to fight it with a five-step approach. Um, you protect your data, obviously, and you protect yourself with antivirus software. Um, and then everyone focuses on good recovery technologies, but there really are three system, three steps that are in the middle there that are often overlooked uh, or ignored. And so let me focus on each one of those as we go through here. The first is that uh, secure. Your, uh, your backup and recovery process is your first line of protection uh, against a ransomware attack. Um, if you have been hit with ransomware and you don't have backups, you're screwed. And so you really need to have uh, a backup and recovery appliance that's delivered in hardened Linux. Uh, most ransomware pirates will target Windows servers. Um, that's 85% of the marketplace. Um, that's the most common. Those are the ones that are used most often by uh, particularly uh, small and mid-sized corporations that are more likely to pay the uh, ransom. So having a DR platform that is purpose-built, um, that is uh, not a kludge of all different types of software with lots of uh, gates and windows that are left open, um, a, a hardened Linux uh, environment, and that's uh, our uh, recovery series appliance that's pictured there. Secondly, testing. Um, you need to be able to test your recoveries regularly and fully so that, um, you know, there are some test procedures that are out there where they'll send you just a, an image of the splash screen of the application as it comes up. That is not good enough. You need to have the applications brought up in a test and dev environment and run for a while so that you can be sure that the application is fully installed. Some of the applications today uh, literally require five or seven servers. Your database is uh, stored on a separate server. There are boot orders that need to be done. You know, server three has to come up before server five and so forth. So you actually need to have the application run for a while in order to, um, uh, to test that it is fully functional. You know, if um, uh, an application can boot just fine if all the files, uh, the data files are uh, infected with ransomware. So, um, and then once you do, uh, you need to get a report uh, and you need to be able to share with your stakeholders the outcome of that testing process. So this is an example of our reports. These reports are literally so good that you can give them to a HIPAA compliance officer during an audit, and, uh, and this is proof that not only do you have a recovery program, but that you test it regularly and the tests are positive. And finally, the third step for ransomware, and this is something new, this is new technology that's been released uh, only for about three or four months, and this is um, the ability to test every single backup against ransomware every single step of the way. So every time um, that you run a backup procedure, that procedure should include ransomware uh, detection uh, as part of that backup. So this is included in our 10.1 operating system. We include uh, AI-based software. Uh, we understand the sort of changes that uh, a ransomware infection can make on a file. 
we look for that sort of footprint uh, and we analyze the randomness of changes as well as uh, the rate of change. And, uh, and we can literally detect a ransomware attack while it's going on uh, because we test it every time you do a backup, whether that's every couple hours or every day, we, we identify every single backup. Uh, if we detect a, a file that uh, has the symptoms of a ransomware attack, we literally send out an alert immediately by email and a dashboard alert in our, uh, the user interface of our recovery appliance. Uh, and we also flag suspected files with an icon so that you don't try to recover uh, using those files. So this is a continuous uh, uh, operation. Ransomware has become that ubiquitous that you need to be protected and be looking for it at all times. So your, your backup and recovery process should be uh, AI enabled to detect ransomware capabilities. Okay, um, the uh, fourth cause of uh, employee uh, cause downtime, and this is data hoarders. Um, there are people, and you can try to educate them at all time, uh, about hoarding data. Uh, somebody sends out a, a four gig uh, PowerPoint presentation to 17 people, 17 people save it, you literally, uh, you know, you're, you're chewing up uh, disks and uh, and all, uh, and it's also then becoming harder and harder to do backups because backup windows have to be extended. Uh, the the backups get larger and larger, and um, we do at Unitrends survey the marketplace um, and see uh, how uh, people you know, challenges they have with their backup procedures, and we found even just going from 2016 to 27 17 that the, the number of enterprises that are protecting petabytes of data uh, is growing. Uh, we tell people they should be plan on uh, their backups when they start when they buy a backup appliance that it, your data sh is growing at about 10% per year and that's compounding um, and that's even if you try to get people to stop saving data uh, and to employ be uh, best practices in data handling. Um, so you need to scale, you need to be able to um, uh, account for that data growth um, and so forth. And so you need to look at cloud storage. Uh, cloud storage is much less expensive than buying SANS or NAS devices. Um, if you still have off-site physical storage such as tapes or removable disks, um, this is going to continue to challenge you and you need to move uh, to uh, disk-based uh, backup. Um, we sell cloud storage. It's a very easy way of uh, doing it. What we do is we sell it in 500 gig increments. Uh, so you literally pick the volume you want. Um, and then you check uh, your retention window. How long do you want to save all of these backups? Uh, and we offer literally uh, 90 days, uh, literally to always, to forever. So obviously you know that if you're, you're saving uh, tax information, you need to save that for about seven years. Uh, if you're a drug company and you're, you have drug trials, um, the law is that you have to save that data five years longer than the death of the last person who participated in your drug trial. And obviously the drug companies are not going to keep data or try to track that information. They're just going to set their cloud retention to forever. So you have that option with the cloud and not have to keep disk spinning for that length of time. Um, and we have the option of providing disaster recovery as a service off of that same data. So you can run it off the data that you're using for your archives. So you get double duty. And our data is not stored in a, uh, a, a storage cloud that's uh, different from a recovery cloud. Your data is kept warm so you can have very fast recoveries. So we literally offer uh, three types of disaster recovery as a service. Uh, we have unlimited DRAS, which allows you to uh, bring up any and all of your applications in, in the cloud on a best effort basis. Uh, it's low cost, it's bundled with the Forever Cloud, and, um, and it's, it's, you know, good uh, DRAS capabilities. But we also offer premium and elite DRAS. Elite DRAS is that we guarantee a 24-hour SLA, service level agreement, um, that we will get your applications up. 
And then we also offer premium, which is a one-hour SLA. So um, for your most critical applications, you can select the uh, uh, premium, the one-hour. For your important applications, you can select delete. And then for the rest of them, you can pr uh, just prove unlimited. So um, protecting that data and then utilizing it for disaster recovery, you get double duty off of, off of that growing data supply. We're so sure that this is uh, the most effective way of dealing with large volumes of data that we have actually developed a cloud cost calculator. Uh, you can go in, it's on our website, Cloud Cost Comparison Calculator, and um, you can put in the volumes of data that you have, the amount of, uh, of uh, recoveries that you think you may have to do in a year, um, the different levels of recovery, and so forth, and we will show you the cost comparisons uh, between Amazon, Azure, and the Unitrends Cloud. So we are that sure that our costs are um, uh, are advantaged over uh, those that are provided by Amazon and Azure. And finally, the enemy within, it's everyone. Uh, to quote uh, the Pogo cartoon, um, we have met the enemy and he is us. Um, we, uh, and I, when I talk to IT people, they're constantly telling me that the number one most common unscheduled interrupt-driven task they are asked to perform literally on a daily basis is to recover a file that's been deleted. Um, you know, all sorts of funny stories about people calling up IT and saying, someone lost my file. It wasn't me. I don't know where it went, um, you know, but I need to recover it and so forth. So you should be able to recover a lost or deleted file in less than five minutes. And I mean from log on to the file actually being active. Um, there needs to be an intuitive user interface so that anybody in IT can go and recover this. You don't have to have special training uh, and so forth so that, you know, late Friday or over the weekend, who's ever on duty should be able to just go in and uh, recover any file uh, so that you don't have this as a designated assignment for just a few number of people and then you have to schedule them and manage and make sure that nobody is off. And so here's an example. This is our user interface and what you can see here is that there is uh, uh, the recovery on the extreme left-hand side of the screen uh, on, the t on the task bar there, you see recover. It is that easy. You press the recover button, it's easy to identify the previous backups. You then open those up, look at the files that are included, and literally designate the file you want to recover, and a single button pushes to recover. It is that easy and, um, uh, and literally less than five minutes uh, to get this, uh, this task done. Um, there are very few people in any organization that haven't lost a file. You know, we all get, you know, filled with zeal to clean out our, our email or our databases and our files, uh, only to discover later on that, uh, that we need them. So that uh, basically concludes the, um, uh, the webinar that uh, I had planned for you. Um, the number one cause of downtime is employees, uh, most likely bad software. Uh, human error, um, large growing databases, and so forth. So your recovery system should be able to handle these as part of uh, everyday process. And so we invite you, we have a couple of resources here that you might be interested in. Um, we have a five minute DR health check. Uh, if you go to the Unitrends um, site, and uh, look for the five-minute health check, and uh, it'll ask you some questions about RPOs, RTOs, and, um, and how often you test, and get a quick um, uh, test is where you stand. You can request a demo of any of our products or any of the capabilities that I've uh, talked to you today about, and you can also then talk to um, some of our experts uh, who can help you uh, with cloud storage, disaster recovery as a service, or any of the uh, premium offerings that we have. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn this over then uh, back to Kevin, uh, who will handle and moderate the Q&A session of our webcast. Kevin? Thanks so much, much Dick. Uh, great presentation. Um, we'll just uh, we'll get started here shortly. If you do have a, a question, you can type it into the bottom right-hand corner of the player, and we'll get to your questions shortly. And as a reminder, this webinar was recorded, so you'll get a, an email with a link to the on-demand version so you'll be able to see this again. Uh, first question is, 
how do how can I set up a test dev environment? What is the requirements for that? Um, okay, uh, so if I can, I can only answer, really only answer that question from a Unitrends perspective. Uh, there is a, a function within our DR and backup uh, application that you can pr uh, go in and designate the location for a test and dev environment. So a remote server or up in the cloud. Uh, you can also do this up in the cloud with the user interface that we have. Um, and then you designate the uh, files you want to uh, be spun up, the applications, and literally uh, pushing a button then will spin up that environment for you. And you can literally watch as the, uh, as the VMs are installed and uh, as the applications come up. So um, I'm sorry, I can't answer that for others or if you don't have a Unitrends product, but uh, with Unitrends, it is literally that easy. Okay, next question. Does Unitrends provide consulting services for implementing a solution or do you have recommended partners? Okay, so um, with our recovery, um, the, so disaster recovery as a service, uh, our DRAS offerings come with what we call white glove services. And so we actually own our own cloud. Uh, we have about 100 petabytes of customer data that is already being protected in the cloud. Um, and, uh, and so what we do is we become your agent for uh, cloud disaster recovery. Uh, so we will work with you to prepare a disaster plan. Uh, we will actually work with you to schedule, you know, which of your applications come up first, what the boot order of the servers are. We will test them with you um, and so forth. So uh, what we find is, is that particularly for uh, small and mid-sized companies, becoming an expert in disaster recovery is quite a challenge and it's not a set of tasks that most IT people really want to have to learn. So uh, we take on that role, we become uh, your agent. And so for you to declare a disaster and begin the recovery in the cloud, literally it's you call us and we implement the plan that we developed with you. So um, we do not contract that out, we become the, we are the agents to do that for you. Okay, next one. Um... What AV technology is used for the pre-spin-up scans on Unitrends Backup in 10.1? Uh, Clam AV. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what the question is beyond that. Uh, you can use any of the software that you would like. Um, so you can designate, uh, if you have some other uh, antivirus software, you can designate that as the, the software platform you use. We have chose to include Clam AV. Okay. Uh, the next question, and this is probably going to help answer that last question as well, does your system go back and check past backups for infections What new threat and what new threat types are in identified or when new threat types are identified? Yeah, so as you choose uh, what backups to use to uh, recover or, or go into a test dev environment, uh, you can set up the security scan and it will go and, and do whatever backups you want. Um, Old backups generally, uh, if you have them off-site and unconnected to the production server, they are not going to get infected by new variants of ransomware uh, if, if you have them isolated correctly. So um, with the, uh, as they're created as backups, uh, we do the scanning at that point and that will ensure that, uh, uh, that they are protected and isolated and, and, and not infected. Okay, here's a question that I'll answer. Uh, for the five-minute DR health check, do we submit on behalf of the customer, or does the customer need to request that for their own devices? And we would just send them the link. Yeah, so the answer to that is the later one. This is for end users, so you would just send them the link so that they could do their own DR health check. Thank you, uh, next, You're welcome. Next question is, I see that you do DR for online three, Office 365. We have hybrid systems. Do you also offer backup on your cloud for on-site exchange, et cetera? Uh, yes. Um, so um, 
so yes, many, most people do hybrid, um, and so our offering on the, on the cloud side is you can literally select just the people you want to have backed up, backed up. So if you think this is a function that uh, should only be applied for executives and managers and so forth, you can designate them and then not protect others. Um, and it does uh, SharePoint and it does OneDrive. Uh, we will be uh, adding uh, SaaS protection for uh, G Suite and Salesforce uh, in the coming months. Uh, so a little bit of uh, 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 foreshadowing there. Um, and then we would cover Office 365 uh, that is on site through our normal um, backup and recovery processes with our appliances. Okay. Well, looks like we have one last question, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, last question is, how can you support a one-hour recovery in the cloud? Doesn't it take longer just to get the data there? Okay, so um, what happens is is that um, with our appliances, uh, the uh, integration with the cloud is uh, it, it's pre, it's all integrated into our appliances. So when our appliances do a uh, incremental backup only. So when you first bring on your appliance, we do a full backup. And from then on, it does incremental only so that it, um, uh, it doesn't affect the production servers. You can do more backups. Uh, the files are smaller and so forth. So that incremental backup is then sent immediately once it's processed, it updates the, the master database, but that incremental only is sent up to the cloud so that your, the copy in the cloud is up to date at all times as well. So, uh, you know, if you know that a hurricane is coming and you want to declare a disaster and be prepared, uh, we have customers that did that with Hurricane Irma, but if it's a sudden thing such as a, a fire or a flood, then your data is already in the cloud and ready to uh, to be spun up. So that that's why we can offer a one-hour SLA. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Dick. Uh, one more time as a reminder, we did record the webinar, and you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to the on-demand version. We also wanted to announce the winner of the $100 Amazon gift card. Congratulations to Nick Garagalano, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, out of New York. And we'll be in touch with you this afternoon for your, your $100 Amazon gift card. Thanks, everybody, and we look forward to having you on future webinars. Take care.